Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're going to review Guerlain's masterpiece, or one of their masterpieces. I mean, they've had a bunch. And they keep churning out new ones, don't they? Après l'onde. And the Eau de Toilette concentration, current formulation, that I've been toying with and playing with for a while. A couple of, uh, you know, of moons. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. So they have this new sticker version uh, for their classics and they all, they all have the same bottle. I mean, you know, everything is becoming very, very homogenized, unfortunately. Uh, I would have wished for every perfume to have their own special identity. But alas, I mean, you know, all these companies, they try to cut corners wherever they can. They're going to try to sell it to you as... Uh, I don't know, trying to have a signature, trying to have a DNA, but then like 20 perfumes are all put in the same bottle, just like for the, you know, Les Exclusives or the Collection Privée or Hermès Sans. You catch my drift, the Louis Vuitton perfume bottles. So Guerlain is kind of playing that game as well. At least in the past, they used to have deferring stickers. They had the original kind of logos, Art Deco logos of, you know, L'Or Bleu. I still have L'Or Bleu. I have it here somewhere, I think. Um, with the original sticker logo, and then now they've changed them all to these kind of, every perfume has its own color, but every perfume has then the same font. They're streamlining everything, which is a pity. Now, also a lot of people are talking about very light formulation for Après Londe. Now, this little baby came out 1906 or 1905. Well, between creating it and releasing it. So we were talking 1905 into 1906. By the way, as we are reviewing this perfume, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Push the join button next to the subscription button. Join me today, get access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Oof. <laughs> also for extra perks, this video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week, so come join the live streams on my main Super Jacob channel. All right, now there's this kind of anise base that uh, an aldehydes, which is one of the first, if not the first aldehydic perfume, just FYI. Um, so before Chanel started the aldehydes, there was Guerlain, okay? And, um, Après l'onde uh, is, uh, it means kind of after the rain shower, after the storm, after, well, in Italian, it would say dopo l'inondazione, <laughs> onde. Um, so I think Guerlain was thinking about summer um, and was thinking about, well, everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. So anyway. So I think Guerlain was thinking about summer, was thinking about rain in summer and that smell of after the rain. Now, of course, when we think about in the here in the Fragrant Bunker, when we think about uh, rain in summer in nature or in the city, if it's been like very, very hot for a certain period of time, the first smell that comes to mind and memory to me is petrichor. Now, petrichor is a chemical smell due to decomposing uh, bacterias in, in earth and soil, but it's a beautiful smell. It's a sweetly sickly smell. This is not it, okay? So Guerlain in 1905, 1906 did not think about Petrichor when they were developing Après l'onde, just to be very clear. So um, you do have that almondy like a toffee, almondy, um, fennel accord in there. And this is something that, unfortunately, I'm not a fan of. Uh, and uh, as of late, uh, a ton of uh, Guerlain perfumes that are kind of their heritage fragrances that are still being manufactured today, still produced today, they all carry that note, that base in them, which does not mesh with me at all, like at all. Now, uh, there is a huge fan base following of Après Londe. 
uh, out there. People love this perfume. People swear by this perfume. By this perfume, people are going to tell you that um, this is the best perfume they've ever smelled. La di da. And it's kind of hard to come on a public platform, you know, have a perfume channel and talk about perfume like this, and then have a differing opinion about what is unanimously claimed to be a masterpiece. Now, here's the thing. Um, I have not smelled the 1906 or 1905 uh, version of Après Londe. I have not smelled the Extrait um, version either. So I only have the Toilette and I only have the current formula and I can also tell you the batch code. 3H01. It's right down there, but also etched into the box at the bottom. Kind of hard to see, but anyway. So what we're dealing with here is 3H01. And so we got anise and cassis in the opening notes is what they give us here. Violet a powdery accord, powdery, no makeup y, powdery accords and carnation in the mid notes, and then vanilla and iris in the bottom notes. So, iris auris root, I want to say. So, it is a powdery, makeup y purple, not for nothing, they gave it a purple color for, this, for the sticker. It is that kind of purpley vibe going on here. Um, so, just to be very clear for all the Guerlain fans out there uh, who are going to, you know, be quite aggressive. And if you dare say something negative about a Guerlain perfume, one of the classics, they just kind of label you as you don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's OK to not like the classics. It's totally fine. Uh, everybody's taste is different. I have a personal issue with that anise fennel um Almondy accord that Guerlain uses for all their perfumes currently for their classics. Uh, and it's particularly heavy in L'Or Bleu. But L'Or Bleu is, there's a beauty to that perfume, very vampire-y and uh, it, it's, it's beautiful in its own way. But it also prevents me from enjoying it and using it all the time because that accord is even more prominent than it is here. This is a very light fragrance all things considered. But another important thing to touch base on is that with all, really, of those early 1900s fragrances from Guerlain, that Belle Epoque, if this is the smell of the Belle Epoque, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't like it, <laughs> you know. Now, we're going to get to the dry down of this one and we're going to talk about when when does Après Londe kick in for me and when it becomes really pleasant. A perfume for me becomes pleasant when I start kind of really sniffing my arm all the time and I can't stop sniffing it, right? And I just like go there all the time and I'm just obsessed with it. Um, most of these classic Irlands, in their opening notes, they push me away. They start calling at me later on. Now, also typical for Guerlain fragrances is very, very multifaceted and structured and textured lifespan of the fragrance on the skin. So you will see, I mean, Jiki is a, is a great example of, again, not the current version, you know, They've watered them down considerably. But Jiki was a masterpiece of texture. It's like you're peeling off like from an onion, one layer, and then underneath you have a whole other world. And you peel that off and underneath is a whole other world. And so that's a, a typical um, savoir-faire and magic of Guerlain, okay, of the perfumeur, of the parfumeur Guerlain. They're, they, are, they know how to create perfumes that are entire mansions that you enter when you spray them on your skin and then you're kind of going through different rooms and you're discovering different levels of the mansion and different there's different colors for every room and there's different smells in every room and there's there's just a different world to discover in every room like that's how complex Guerlain fragrances are or were you see these legendaries the legendaires that are now being re-edited and reissued, um, they bear 
a memory of old grandeur. You know, it's a little bit like I was watching um, Downton Abbey <laughs> the other day and all the seasons like one after the back to back, you know, now that it's all over, you can kind of watch everything plus the movies and the light motif that kind of goes throughout the entire show is one generation passing on to the next generation and saying, oh, things are changing. Things are changing. Everything is becoming watered down. Uh, most of these big houses or mansions or abbeys, they're kind of, they don't have the money to sustain themselves anymore. More and more of the staff is being let go. So you cannot preserve the old ways. Uh, whether or not the old ways were good or bad, I'll leave that to you to decide. Uh, I'm just kind of trying to step outside and just observe from the outside without having judgment on aristocracy and, and feudalism and this and that. Just, we're not going to enter into the politics of things. But just the way of conversation, a lot of the conversation happening in that show was about change. And it was about how, well, we're still alive today, but things are way more different. And they're losing intensity. They're losing luster. They're losing quality as opposed to how they were just 5, 10, blah, blah, 20 years ago. And that's kind of what the whole Downton Abbey thing became to me. It's just kind of the fading of one era and the beginning of another. So, and yet all the characters are alive. Well, some of them kind of pass away throughout the show. But, you know, the main characters are there and they're living and changing and, ad and adapting to reality. And modern times become kind of a watered down, distilled version of heritage, of tradition. Everything becomes just more loosey-goosey. That's what you get here. Uh, you get you know, the idea of Downton Abbey, like season one, <laughs> but you get it packaged in season, no, not even season six, you get it packaged in the second movie. You know what I mean? Like after season six is over, we got the two movies and this, the, the second movie was even worse than the first one. So in my humble opinion, and everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes, only not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged in just my opinion. So this is what you get here you get the second movie of Downton Abbey. But they're still trying to sell it to you as if it were season one. You see what I mean? Even before the First World War, we're talking, you know. They're trying to sell it to you as if we're still in the Victorian era. And and But the perfume regulations have changed. The IFRA regulations have changed. Certain ingredients are considered too highly allergenic so they take them out of the fragrance so there's you always have to find a different way to re-envision reimagine a composition for the times you're living in and now i do not know if in 1906 or 1905 après londe if it had this heavy anise fennel almondy vibe to this this chemical i don't think it did and it's almost like a pasty, doughy, almost like a play doughy vibe going on with a lot of these new ones, which I I don't like that accord. That to me needs to go. And it does sometimes in some fragrances fade out and then I'm stuck with the beautiful dry downs. This one has very short longevity. Uh, this one, two hours tops on the skin and it's gone. And this is why I sprayed a ton of it at the beginning of this video because I really want to go through all those layers of the perfume before it's completely gone. I usually don't spray so much when I review a fragrance. This one is very light. It is an eau de toilette, but you can totally treat it as a body mist. When it starts fading out of that cassis, fennel, anise thing, it goes into that uh, other territory of the dry down where we hit the flowers, uh, violet, carnation, iris, and vanilla. Mine is the violet with which I do have an issue. For me, Mesia by Chanel, um, love-hate relationship with it. Um, violet can be abrasive. It can be moody. Sometimes violet can be very screechy and acidic to my nose. Um, and some other days, if the humidity is right outside, the temperature is right, then, uh, you know, the violet will be docile and friendly. This is coincidentally also why I believe that you know, Olivier Polge did Mizia because Mizia was Chanel's Coco's frenemy. They were very feisty to, to each other, loved each other, hated each other. So Mizia is a perfume. It's a hit or miss. There are days when you, the eau de toilette, the eau de parfum, mm. 
the other toilet is, is which is discontinued now but uh, that's the, the formulation i have mesia kind of comes and goes in waves for me i love it i hate it love it i hate it and it's that overdose of violet well mesia also has the raspberries which i could live without but mesia also has the oris root blah, blah 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 a lot of people actually say that mesia was some sort of homage to après londé isn't that interesting i mean sure both aldehydic both violet heavy very violet heavy this is a very violet heavy perfume and both have that oris iris oris root iris accord um i do prefer après londé to misia however yes especially in the dry down aisha in the chat says i could never get on with misia perfume yeah there's something about it that is acidic in a way right So, but now that the, now that that opening play doughy almondy vibe is gone, and we're going into the soft powdery notes, right? Soft iris vanilla, violet notes. And then it becomes really beautiful. Absolutely zero vibes of after the rainstorm, as the title of the perfume suggests. Um, you know, I, I do not get this après l'onde vibe after the rainstorm or dopo l'inondazione, <laughs> the big thunderstorm in summer. I don't get that wetness. But what I do get, and this is something that I've spoken about a lot in my uh, Guerlain Classics reviews, this certain bourgeoisie depression in the way that these Belle Epoque perfumes smell and were composed, there's a certain sadness to it and you can't really put your finger on it. And I know a lot of reviewers don't really talk about this, I think because it's really hard to put into words, but there's a certain type of smell that these classics have, whether it be Liu, which is also in the Legendaire uh, collection, or whether it be Mitsuko, or wh whether it be L'Or Bleu or Vol de Nuit. I've reviewed all of them uh, and I own bottles of all of them. It, they all have this link that links them together, and that is this heavy sense of, of time that has passed. Don't get me wrong, I'm not an ageist in any way. I don't um, consider these to be grandma perfumes, like people say. I, I don't classify perfumes that way ever. Um, but a time that has passed means that um, it's almost like the fragrance in here is, is trying to live today, but it's not its time. And this is a really complicated um concept to, to explain so bear with me you will encounter people who will tell you that this smells very modern and in many ways this is very edgy for today's standards okay après l'onde even in its current formula shines you know uh in its current formula toned down they're trying to adapt it to, to modern times like it's it has character all Guerlain perfumes do. But at its core, it smells of a time that has passed and but not in a good way. <laughs> this is the this is the thing. It smells of a and most of these legendary Guerlains from the legendary collection. Most of them go into that territory of uh, fear. We're talking pre-First World War, uncertainty. There was excitement in the air. We, you know, we did have uh, the entire Industrial Revolution. A lot of things were happening, okay? But at the same time, there was that other world of old tradition, of people who could not afford machines, of people who could not afford the modern life. The early 1900s were very much a split, at least in, in Europe, um, 
very split identity between extreme poverty and and life that was still in the early 1800s, really, the way that people could afford or not afford to live, as opposed to these rich new people or generational wealth people who could afford all the pleasantries of modern times. So that kind of beginning, you know, 1905, 1906, saw this duality between humongous and fast innovation for the very few who could afford it, and extreme reduction and absence of all of that for the masses who could not afford it, masses who still lived having just one outfit, you know, th or two outfits because you got to grow out of and in, in of it, in and out of it as you're growing up in your lifetime. Um, people who don't have, you know, toilets in their homes. I mean, we're talking, that's also 1906, not just this, oh, you know, the fabulous times. We're, this is a perfume for the depressed rich person in 1906 that fantasizes about bucolic life in nature after the rain has fallen and they get to rejoice because one of their servants has cut the violets from the garden, from the dewy garden after the rain, the rain has fallen after the storm and they bring it into the house and these rich people that are sitting down on their chaise longue, they're like sitting down and observing reality and thinking, oh, woe is me, it's almost supper time. That's this. You see, this is the issue that I have with a lot of these Guerlain perfumes. I think you need to be a type of person who enjoys that type of thought process that fantasizes and romanticizes about this epoch in a way that I do not and I cannot. My morals just do not let me do that. I, I would feel too guilty. You see, this is to me a smell of a person who does not have problems, a privileged person uh, at the beginning of the century that uh, can enjoy, you know, the subtleties of life while the masses are literally starving and working their ass off just to be able to afford a little bit of bread. So they do not have that luxury of enjoying the thought process, the psychological process, the philosophical pr process of a perfume like this. And there's that snobism attached to these old school Guerlain perfumes that is very present still to this day in these formulations. And so this is this is the part that, you know, back in the day when this one was released, the rich upper classes, they enjoyed this smell because this smell further dis distinguished them and separated them from the working class, from the lower classes. It, it elevated them even more. It's like a kind of a, a, the perfumes of that time also in a way embodied and justified the sense of entitlement that these people had. And boy, did they have a sense of entitlement. It was actually granted. It was for granted. It was like, yeah, of course, I come from a rich family, of course. Like there was no even, you know, questioning that, the entitlement. And so this is why the perfumes could express that, because morally it was fine. Morally back then it was okay to be entitled in that way. And that's at the core of these Guerlain perfumes. And I and it, it, it clashes with me. And this is why I cannot fully love them, because I am not part of that class, nor do I wish to be. Nor do I believe in the class system. And this is where I find I have the biggest problem with Guerlain fragrances of the past era. Historically speaking, I see the beauty in them because they tell a story. It's like reading a history book without going through the pages of the history book without reading the words written. And usually we know that history is written by the winners, not by the losers. But times are changing, thankfully. And also thanks to social media, now even who does not win the war gets to write their story. That's the beauty of the times we're living in. Don't take that for granted, people. That little bit of freedom we got now that we did not have back then, 
do not take that for, for granted. Perfumes today echo that m bigger equality between social statuses. Today, we also have categories of perfumes we can also call, you know, cheapies. You can get wonderful perfumes for, you know, nowadays, Lulu by Cacharel, Eden, Obsession by Calvin Klein. I mean, these are perfumes you can get for 10 to $20, 10 bucks. If you're lucky, you know, they have all these discounts. And I love those perfumes to bits. It doesn't have to be this expensive niche always. You know what I mean? You didn't have that privilege back in the day. You didn't. Now you can go online, you can find somebody who's selling, you know, uh, a Guerlain, uh, the Legendaire collection, and uh, for half the price. <laughs> you didn't have that back. You couldn't afford getting Après Londé just like that back in the day. It was a classist perfume, not just this one, Guerlain in general. And so these old school fragrances from Guerlain have that in them. It's in their DNA. It is in their DNA. And... And so from a historical point of view, I love this perfume because it tells a very clear story. And the story is not of, oh, the romantic smell of flowers after the rain has fallen. And oh, the poetry. And I feel like I'm catapulted in that garden, in that time, in that villa. That's not the story this perfume tells me. The story I smell is of the actual servant who has worked for a family. It's a second generation. The servant's mother and father also worked for the family, and now they're born into it. They're also working for the family. And the mistress of the house has this fable for being in the countryside in summer where the rain showers are, and she loves to collect all those flowers and smells of dewy plants after the rain has fallen and loves to write about it and fantasize and romanticize about it, but never gets her feet wet nor hands dirty. It's the servant who has to run out into the rain, wait for the right time, wait for the right bloom, collect pluck the flowers in the right way and manner, cut them in the right way as instructed and directed by the owners and bosses of said villa, and then bring them to the house, position them properly, developing an entire system of how to place the plants on the table, on the linen cloth, how to dry them properly, how to position them, in order for then the mistress to arrive and sniff them and feel the poetry and never know how complicated it actually was to collect all these flowers, to go out in the rain, to go out after the rain, to go through the mud. Because that's what this perfume tells me, you see. I smell it and I immediately envision the struggles of the servants in order to create this comfortable, cozy world for the rich. Every time I smell a Guerlain perfume from that time, that's, what, that's the story they tell me. And that's a true story. So you see, from that point of view, it's a magical perfume because it documents the time. And like a history book, it narrates the time. But you have to be intelligent enough to read between the lines and to hear what it really has to tell you. You need emotional intelligence for that. You need sound morals. And you need a little bit basic knowledge of your history and history books. And once you have all that, and then you sniff Après Londé, the picture is perfectly clear. One side struggles, the other one rejoices. The rich have that power and the money to rejoice, but of course they're also depressed because, oh, woe is me. Life in the countryside, oh, oh. I don't know what to do. I can't wait to be back in the city at the beginning of the week, darling. I just came to the countryside to smell in summer 
all of these plants after the rain. Oh, let me go write some poems. Let me go write some, you know, pain of the soul type of short texts that I'm going to publish in some new publication that's coming out. You know, I have the right contacts and the right connections in the city, darling. You know, we all know each other. All the academia. We all meet up in the cafes in gay old Paris and we talk about our mental struggles, you know, while we wear Guerlain perfumes that give us this vibe of emotions. We're feeling them deeply. I think these perfumes can be much better understood today than they could back in the day. Back in the day, they were taken for granted because of the entitlement. You know, the person who could afford it enjoyed it, felt it to the core as a beautiful pleasantry of the luxuries that you could afford. But today, it tells us a deeper story. It also tells us the story of the people who could not afford it, who could not afford this luxury, who could not live this lifestyle. And it does smell of that entitlement and that loneliness and the suffering and the struggles. Really, if you really smell it, underneath the beauty of that powdery, delicate, velvety, vanilla, orris rudy, irisy, violety accord with the smidge of carnation, underneath all those beautiful nuances of dusty, airy, breezy flowers, you will find the dirt. You will find the struggle. You will find the pain. And not the pain of the mistress and the mister of the house. No, it's the pain of the servants who made this perfume possible after all. And that sadness is what ultimately makes Après Londe beautiful. Because it's honest. This perfume is very honest. If you know how to listen to it, it tells that honest, honest story. And that honesty, who gives me goosebumps, that honesty It's hard. It's hard to, to, to hear that sad story, right? But it's beautiful that it's there, that it's documented without words, without printed text form. And yet, through the notes of a fragrance, it whispers to you. It whispers the story of the servants, of their struggles. Almost as if it's not allowed to say because it comes from a time when certain things were not allowed to be spoken about or talked about. And yet this perfume whispers about it. And you can hear it only if you know how to listen. So you see that duality. I'm torn between loving it and loathing it. I loathe what it stands for. But I love the story it tells me. So I'm very much split in the middle. How's that for a perfume review for you from Guerlain? Let me know if you've seen another one online that has the same type of commentary or commentary, darling. Until next time, I hope uh, you stay perky, <laughs> stay sane, stay emotionally intelligent. Very important if you want to really hear the stories the perfumes have to tell you. You need to stay emotionally intelligent clever and read know how to read and reading is not just what is printed black on white on paper reading is also an emotional thing there's a subtle sub level of reading like reading a perfume and magically for you it's the same day but for me quite a bit of time has passed I do have an update to add about Après Londe. And uh, I've been testing it out for a while now. Friends have been commenting on it. Um, and I've been living with it day and night, humidity, non-humidity. And I have the dry down here. So interesting to note, I still have an issue with that marzipan, almondy, aldehyde, anise accord. But once it hits the dry down, and we are talking 
this. <laughs> you see, uh, I prompted the AI to generate um, an uh, kind of after the rain, after the shower garden with purple flowers. I mean, we got violets, we got iris, uh, whatever the AI kind of interpreted as iris and um, violets and other purple flowers. There is indeed, when you wait a long time, a component of post rain, shower, humidity, wetness with violets. And yes, that powdery touch in there is, is uh, the iris or orris root. But interestingly, what I've noticed, even though the strength of the perfume is really relatively weak, meaning after an hour or two, it's kind of gone. What stays, however, and this is where the perfume shifts into a different territory. And of course, we have to layer and texture Guerlain fragrances. Also, their reviews, because, you know, the, no other perfumes like Guerlain perfumes deliver, even in their reformulated, watered down versions, they still deliver, you know, peeling off like layers of onions, one facet after the next. So even after the strength of the perfume is gone, after a short while, and you can't really sniff it on you, you do get a, a ghost kind of memory, like a flashback of something humid, wet, and purple. And that is indeed the heart of Après Londe. And in fact, what is so actually magical at the end of this journey is when you uh, warm up the fragrance on your skin by blowing through the nostrils, like hot air on it, and then inhaling immediately, you pop those last molecules open. That's when you get the full violet and iris beauty of the fragrance. And it's moist and wet and humid, damp, after the shower, after the rain has fallen. However, it is very subtle. It creeps up on you almost like a spirit or a ghost. And you gotta wait three or four hours for that to come. And it is a whisper, only a whisper of, of that humid, damp, post-rain, post-shower scenario like, like we have right here. Uh, and you, and um, now, here's the thing. Like I said it throughout the entire review, uh, we have this historical connotation. We have the memory of the early, you know, 1905, 1906. Poverty, aristocracy, bourgeoisie, Guerlain kind of falls into a territory where really you had to be rich to afford fragrances. So there's that aspect of me smelling this and remembering actually the people who cannot afford it, who could not afford it back in the day. Nowadays, it's a little bit easier, you know, also... With internet, you have possibilities uh, of finding these also at a reduced price, and it's not like you always have to buy them directly from Guerlain at a full, uh, you know, at the full retail price. But there's other options as well out there if you do your research and are careful, obviously. Uh, so, bearing in mind the historical aspect, the moral connotations, and then forgetting them for a second while you enter that last breath of the fragrance, which is this damp, lonely, silent, isolated, beautiful, immersed in nature, but feels still untouched by mankind, damp after the shower, purple, green garden. Uh, once you enter that garden... you fall in love fully with the perfume. That garden is very faint. It is really, really towards the end of the journey of this fragrance on your skin. And once you hit that territory, I mean, that's where real magic happens because it, it transports you completely into this humid, misty, 
landscape where you are alone with yourself, with your emotions. And this is also why I say Guerlain fragrances have a always a level of depressive or depressing vibes to them because they make you feel like you are very introspective and you and you have to contemplate your existence and the sadness surrounding how limited our life is and how short the amount of time is that we spend on this wonderful planet. And as the perfume whispers its last breath on your skin, that's exactly what it tells you. Enjoy that short-lived moment of beautiful introvert and somehow melancholic sadness after the rain in late spring, early summer. It's a very lonely perfume, uh, but that whisper at the end is what makes it worth it to me. Uh, I fight through the opening notes, which I'm not a fan of, but then after you wait and wait and wait, it shyly comes out from behind the clouds and tells you the story of the misty garden in bloom, that violet iris garden in bloom in late spring, early summer. And you have by accident happened to kind of wander into it and experience it all on your own. And then you go home to tell everybody about it. Nobody believes you. Not a single soul believes that you found this garden. Not a single soul believes that you could actually take them back there. A little bit like the story of the omnibus. Have you read the short story by For Forster? Check it out. That kid that took the omnibus and then came back home to tell the tale and nobody believed him. That's kind of what happens with Après Londé. You do not believe it until you really want to believe it. And then it shows its shy face and then disappears right away. I mean, that's magic. So here goes another layer of, of this perfume onion that is Gautier, uh, <laughs> Guerlain. And until next time, I hope you will... Uh, Contemplate it. Try to find a, at least a deacon or something. Current version is really good. Smell it. Feel it. Let it take you there. And if it doesn't, oh well. Maybe you didn't believe it. <laughs> I don't know. What could tell you? It just kind of hit me just like that at once. And once it hits you, it stays with you. You can't unsee it once you've seen that garden. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. A thumb it up if you did. Subscribe. And until next time, never forget to never give up on fragrant love. Bye.